Ebi Mobweri, A. Elezianya. Ebi is the director of Little Einstein Montessori Academy, a vibrant, dynamic, and fast growing Montessori center in the FCT. She separately heads I Teach Africa Initiative, an international non profit organization that seeks to build, encourage, and inspire people, educating them through various means and taking education to the grassroots. She is also a co founder of We Survived One, an advocacy group for survivors of domestic violence. AB is a phenomenal leader, known for transforming lives everywhere she goes. With almost a decade, of corporate experience in the banking industry, well spent with records of excellence. She is also the author of the books Restless and Purple's Adventure 101, a highly sought after speaker who is well known for teaching in a fresh and practical manner, engaging the minds of her pupils, women and listeners actively. Her husband, Okichuku, sons, David and Daniel and daughter Tamara are a constant source of love joy and support to her. Orok Uno is a business consultant and he is the founder and managing partner at Christopher Kings and Associates, a business management consulting firm. He also holds the position of director in other companies operating within the security and safety, ICT and agricultural sectors. He is a fellow of the Institute of Management Consultants and also has a certified management consultant certification and practicing license authorized by the International Council of Management Consulting Institutes, IMCI, which recognizes his competency in over 50 countries of the world. Uruk has gained suitable expertise in the small and medium enterprise SME development by functioning in diverse capacities. Arak Uno is a member of the Nigerian Institute of Management, NIM, as well as the Institute of Professional Managers and Administrators, IPMA. Chief Asasu Ibinidion is the CEO of TOS TV Network, a community of Pan-Africanists invested in the principles of Africa's economic, cultural, scientific and political restoration. She is also the executive director of TOS Foundation, which focuses on the empowerment of women and girls. At TOSF, they focus on five thematic areas, girl-child education, child marriage, violence against women and girls, women in politics and leadership, and maternal health. Through their foundation and Pan-African community, they hope to imbibe the spirit of Ubuntuism in every person of African descent and heritage. Chief Osasu Ibenidian is very passionate about Africa making a change in African governance, promoting the beauty of Africa, and improving the lives of the everyday people. Charles Atuda is Africa's premier brand strategist and engagement consultant. Over the years, he has enriched the branding landscape with his innovative approach to brand building across all sectors of the economy. An alumnus of the prestigious Wits Business School, South Africa, he is the principal consultant of Adstress Brand Management Consultants. He is an accomplished author, public speaker, and thought pioneer. His scholarly thoughts are caught in two of his publications, Brands Arise, The Nigerian Brand Renaissance, and The Charles Otudo Personal Brand Guide. He believes entrepreneurship is the eventual fate of the African economies. This has affected his investment in entrepreneurs through his Charles Otudo Brand Masterclass series that has held consecutively for over four years. A beneficiary of numerous awards, including the Nelson Mandela African Leadership Award, he is a part, board of directors, Nigerians in Diaspora Europe, member of personnel, PITC Leadership Center, member advisory board, Vivacity Global, and the Bayel initiative, The Hague, Netherlands. Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's good to hear from everyone. I hope you all can hear me. It looks like network is uh, giving us uh, some challenges today. Can you all hear me?
Hi, everyone. Can you all hear me? It'd be nice to know if you can hear me. Um, Taiwo, our host, I can only see myself. Oh, super, 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 super. All right, so everyone, you know, uh, welcome you once again to the Startup Summit. And, um, you know, it's a real pleasure to be amongst the brilliant minds who are going to share a thing or two with us as regards um, the challenges that startups face, especially when it comes to talking about government policy. Um, Taiwo, are you with me? Okay, yeah, your video is back now. I can see you. Yes, yes. I can't hear you. How's it going? Okay. okay. I can hear you loud and clear. Oh, super, super. So I wanted to know which of our panelists are around already, so I can call them in. We have um, Miss Miss Eb. We have okay. uh, Chief Osazu just stepped out, but yes, we're good to go. It's, uh, it's an interesting Chief day. Around? Interesting, interesting. Yes. Uh, so uh, it would be nice to just have everybody at once, and then we'll just uh, then take this on greatly. Uh, so welcome everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Can we? Can you all hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, so we have. Hi, Chief. Can, Chief can Sazu, have... how are you doing? It's good to meet you, Charles. It's it's a pleasure meeting you too. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, Chief, we can. I can hear you. Uh, I can hear you loud and clear. Yeah. Welcome, Mr. Charles. Welcome, Chief. Welcome, AB. A rock. It's okay, an interesting and important Charles. time for yeah. us, even in this nation. Good morning, Charles. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good to be here. Okay, so I think this is one of the things we have to grapple with, you know, um, network connectivity uh, as yeah. business. Uh, but yes, we will overcome and uh, so remain undaunted in this quest. Now, so a lot of people ask um, Taiwo, why, why this startup summit and why now? Uh, we think that we are in precarious moments and if we want to definitely have change, then it's imperative that we start to profile solutions. And the startup summit is one of such uh, uh, solutions that is coming out from the the, the the bedrock of um, strength Africa, just so that we can rightly position uh, young and budding entrepreneurs start up, uh, so that they can start to create opportunities, particularly for Nigerians, and indeed this would accelerate uh, development, growth and development in Nigeria and indeed Africa. So I'd like to thank you all for you know, and accepting to be part of this interesting session. It promises to be, you know, interesting to you know, come up a better one. I'm so excited and I truly cannot um, convey my excitement even as I speak right now. So Mr. Arok, uh, it's over to you. In case we're having this, I'll be coming in uh, just to support. Thank you all and we promise to be a wonderful time here. In tackling the challenges that we face regarding government policies. Thank you. Yes. Oh dear. Looks like I've lost everyone again. I'm, I'm back again. I think Oroch is having some glitches. Um, so don't worry, that's why we must be resilient and dynamic with how we do our things. So I have, um, I'm bringing in um, AB. AB, you're on live. Um, what are expectations from this session? Uh, what What are you just saying? What are our expectations? The audience are asking, what do we expect to hear 
from you today. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I hope you can hear me. Yes, you can. Okay, my name is Ebi Elezanya, yes, and it's such, it's such a pleasure to be here today, and I want to thank everyone for joining us on this session. Of course, this is something that is pertinent to every one of us here in Nigeria. As long as you live in Nigeria, you're going to be going through one of these, even though um, your business has been in, in, in structure or in place for a very long time. What are some of the things that we want to take away from here? We're hoping that these discussions, as we begin to talk about these things, we begin to see what the loopholes are, which we already know, and begin to offer yeah. solutions for um, how to overcome them. This particular year, for me, has been one of the most trying years. If business was ever um, tough in this arena or in this part of the nation, then it's even much more tougher right now because of the global pandemic. And I think this, this particular summit is apt and, and is right for this time like this, so that we begin to look at our policies. The government of many nations have seen the flaws in their system, so have we. And so if we begin to talk about it and begin to restructure our system in preparation for what is coming next, because nobody understands what is going to come next. However, if we begin to look within, we will be, begin to start helping ourselves to sort the problems. And on this platform today, we have great minds like Mr. Charles Trudeau, we have um, Orok, we have um, Osas, Chief Osazua, and we're just speaking, Osas, Chief Osazua, and we're just speaking about what is um, personal to all of us so that we bring out these issues and then we begin to trash them. So I'm hoping that by the end of this session, you watching us and even we that are speaking will be able to come up with a consensus agreement about what it is that we need to do to move forward from the issues that we're dealing with. If it's in terms of government policies, if it's in terms of personal or, or with, within the um, uh, within the private sectors, within the government sectors, at least something concrete will come out of this. Probably even a recommendation to the people in power right now to be able to help um, in solving some of the problems. Because I see that sometimes when you're in something, you cannot view, the people from viewing from outside have better understanding or better um, advice for you within because you are within, but you cannot see. So I'm hoping that this will support and help many businesses going forward. Thank you, sir. Awesome, awesome. awesome. Uh, you know, um, Mr. Orok, uh, you know, but so, Mr. Charles, it would be nice to add you right now. Yeah. I'm here. Yes. Hey. I'm here. Can you hear me? I can. Sir, so what, what do you want to? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, at the end of What this do session, we expect from this, I ex this session? I expect to have a, to see a robust discussion that, um, highlights the frustrations uh, inherent in the system that um, um, creates impediments to entrepreneurship, entrepreneurships, and startups. And uh, with the array of speakers and um, panelists, I'm very, very sure and convinced that um, the, the outcome of this whole series of sessions will become a, a positivism in terms of the uh, the uh, agreements that will add value um, to the entrepreneurship landscape, both in the short, mid, and long term. I'm excited to be here, and um, I'm ready to add value. Let's roll. Welcome, everyone. Mr. Tayo. Chief, how are you, Chief Osazu? Can you hear me? We can hear you loud and clear. I can hear you loud and clear. Awesome. I'm so sorry. The network keeps going in and out, um, but I've been trying my best to follow up the conversation. It's my pleasure being here, participating in this very auspicious uh, conference. So first of all, I'd like to congratulate you, Taiwo aka the oracle for putting together this uh you know gathering so thank you so much for inviting me um i don't know if you have any questions directly you would like me to answer oh. 
what, what do we need to answer? We would like to know what to expect from this session. We're about to start off now with our of truth. Taiwo, if I heard you correctly, because you, as I said, you keep going in and out. I don't know if it's my network or yours. Are you asking for my expectations of the conference? The expectations on the side of the audience. What do you are you delivering to them? I'm so sorry, I'm struggling to hear you. If you don't mind, I would take it one more time. And if I can't hear you, then I'll have to log off and log back on. Okay, um, the, the audience that are waiting, what do they expect from you today? Oh, thank you. So what can you expect from me? Yes, yes, yes. You, I am not a policy maker, so I will be contributing my own humble opinion from, you know, interacting with policy makers and lawmakers also on, um, you know, how we can draft people centric, people oriented policies that benefit, you know, from my conversations with uh, men and women in a position or in the helm of affairs um, that draft policies that affects everyday Nigerians. So that's the expectation you can have of me uh, on today's uh, panel. I hope that answers your question. Absolutely, you answered my question and thank you. I hand it over back to Mr. Orok Uno to run this show. Yeah, can you check that you're not muted? Okay, so I, I think whatever it is, we just must move on. So, um, maybe. Yes, sir. A A B. I'm here. I'm over here. Right here. Can you hear me? Yes, go on, sir. Okay. So, so can, can you can you just tell us a bit about your foray into into the educational sector? Your foray into the educational sector. Can you shed some light on how you got into the educational sector, you know, and maybe that would just be a good start. <laughs> okay, thank you once more. Um, I, I think for Mr. Orok, we can see him, but we can't hear him. So I think that's, that's just the only issue with his. Well, for me, I am, I've been in the educational sector now seven years. Getting in for me was, was one of the major challenges that I faced was information. I, I didn't understand um, 
where I was supposed to go to to get information because it wasn't readily available. I had asked a lot of people about how and where I was going to get registration. Information at that time in 2013 was not um, readily available online and I just moved back from the UK. And I had to, I struggled a lot trying to put things together because these things were not available. The agency which is in charge of registering crutches, um, toddler classes in Nigeria, I, I think up until now, they're still not very, um, the, that's the social services. They're not very much online. This is what we're talking about. There's still, there's still things that they need to put up online. If we have to register, we have to go back to their office somewhere in area 10, and then we have to um, book for appointments. We see one person, we have to wait to see the next person. You know, these were the challenge. The major challenge for me was information gathering. I, I had a lot of tough time finding out who I was going to meet for permits. I knew I had to register with the CAC. Thank God right now the CAC is upgrading and ha has upgraded their services. Um, and a lot of things can be accessible online. However, there's still a lot of delays in terms of um, certifications and a lot of delays with other things. Um, but then majorly, I found, I found that information was not available for startups, who want, people who wanted to go into schools. I had to consult already people who were already in the education sector. I had to also consult, consult bigger schools because they were already doing what it was that I wanted to do. Um, part of the reasons why I joined was because I, I, I literally had a passion for children and I just, it, it's a calling for me. I, I just needed to know that I can do this in Nigeria without any itches. But the major one I felt was very, um, very um, discouraging in 2013 was that information was not readily available for those who wanted to go into registering a, 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 a crash or a preschool. Even right now, I have seen new school owners, people new entrants into the education sector, asking a lot of questions with registration, with um, um, fees and charges, tenement rates, um, development fees, and all those other things. It's, it's still a, a, a very much a problem right now if you're, if you're going into the education sector. Okay, great. So I, I love that intro, and I, I love the fact that you're able to, you know, succinctly articulate some of the things you had to contend with starting out. I uh, would like to have uh, Mr. Charles just say a few. Hello, Mr. Charles. Yeah, once again, good morning, everyone. Um, I think for me, um, the major challenge I had when I envisaged this vision of starting Astrat and then the other sub brands was um, working through a process where for every information you need to back up your, 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 your zeal and your dream and your vision. And you know, when you, in back then, I was younger, so I, my dreams were moving faster than reality and then the infrastructure itself to back it up in terms of information, the processes, and um, well, first of all, we have infrastructural, infrastructural deficiencies in the system. We have the um, regulatory issues in terms of ability, for them, the ability of regulators to even put together a, a, a concise database and, uh, of pra existing practitioners, and then um, the processes to become a, a certified practitioner so you can practice, you know? So, and then beyond all that, um, as an entrepreneur that was in a hurry, um, you have to go through the process with CAC back then. Um, you must go through, the process was just too tedious. So for me, what I did was um, to, to speed run things. I just, I, um, I um, um, what's what I want to use now? I just employed people as consultants to handle and make life easier. And, and then with time, I found out that the system does work, but at the same time, the system cannot work at your pace. As an entrepreneur, you are in a hurry because in your sleep, you can see the end point which nobody else can see. So your vision is driving you while awake and while asleep, and you just want to see things move faster because you have no time. But regulatory issues and 
Of course, the system itself will always go to their own normal processes. So the challenges remain there, but at the same time, once you are focused on moving forward, what I did was, that, like I said, putting in place structures that ensures that I focus on the strategy, the back end, while some other people take care of the day-to-day -day management of how to restart the company, how to put in place and get to execute. So at the end of the day, you move faster in this economy if you move, if you put in place structures that help you to activate your dreams, not waiting for the system. So that helped me many years ago. And it's glad, it's, I'm excited to see that despite the passing of time and years, those same issues that became, that became stumbling blocks are no longer really stumbling blocks if you understand how the system works. I'm not saying the system is perfect, but between then and now, I feel and I think that there's been a, a bit of an evolution. But the only challenge I still see is access to funds, access to um, um, if, um, the, the infrastructural deficiencies remain the same. And that's still a challenge for me as, I, as in business. But with time, I believe that these issues um, will go beyond where we are now to the next level. I also, I am, I'm, 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 I also believe that Nigerians are the most gifted, most resilient set of entrepreneurs across the globe. Because when the system dis delays you, this, we move on. So that worked for me over the years. And, but at, at the end of this summit, we need to be able, I see us being able to articulate and adding value to discourse in such a way that we should be able to tell government and the regulatory authorities, this is what we are going to real case, life case studies. So I'll be able to add value by giving real life, life case studies of what I went through, what I'm going through right now in the process, and then what will we say to happen in the future. So once again, that's my own um, little contribution to this. Hope you guys- All right, thank you very much. Hope you guys heard me. Thank you very much, Charles. Okay, can okay. you hear me now? Yes, I can. Oh, super, super. I, I, I got to apologize for the network problems. You know, I think I had some challenges at my end as well. You know, so thank you very much very, for your very brilliant contribution. I have no doubt that, you know, there's a lot to learn from you. All right, so um, how about Chief? Is Chief still with us? Chief Osasu, are you still with us? Hey, Chief Osasu. I think your mic is mute, though. Chief, I think your mic is mute. Okay, super. Uh, Chief, can you hear me? Hi, Arok, I can hear you clearly. I, there's a oh. delay in communication. I think my, my voice is coming a bit late, but I can hear you very clearly. Go ahead, please. Oh, oh super, super. Okay, so Chief, I thought to ask you, um, what do you think are the main issues you know with regards um, government policy as it you know uh, let's hear a bit, a bit of specifics and this is speaking from your own point of view because you are a business leader you know so can you pinpoint some of the specific areas that you think government policies tend to impact uh, maybe your business for instance um thank you for that question i would actually love to speak aside being you know But I would like to speak from the vantage point of just a Nigerian citizen. Um, I believe sometimes our leader silo of the people. So they do not take into regard what the common man on the street is going through or how this affects their daily lives. So let's look at the government policy to close our land borders, for instance. So last year, I think it was late last year this happened. 
And um, on one of my programs, we discussed this. We talked about the economic effects this will happen on, you know, Nigerian businessmen and business women. And the government, um, you know, fought back saying that this was due to uh, the smuggling, the high rate of smuggling from our land borders. And they were doing this actually to boost business within the country. But as we can see now, a year after, the negative effects this has had on not only small businesses, but medium and large scale businesses as well. The inflation rate right now for food prices is at 110.5%. It has more than doubled. So when the government makes policies, they need to sit down with the market man and market woman. They need to sit down with the entrepreneurs. They need to sit down with, you know, ordinary Nigerians, not just, you know, people in high places or in their executive chambers or, you know, in their their fellow governors. They need to sit down and feel the pulse of the people. How can this policy impact you? What are going to be the long-term and short-term effects of them? So I think we need to do more of that. And that's one thing I advocate for on my platform because we take pride in taking the words from everyday Nigerians to the ears of their leaders and vice versa. So that's why we keep on advocating for bridging the gap, bridging the communication gap, you know, between the people and those we've elected into power. So um, I, as of today, would rate uh, the effectiveness of government policies at an abysmally low level. I think they could do more and they need to, as a matter of urgency, take action and reaching out to the common man before they start to make policies that affects them. All right. Thank you very much for that. Looks like the network kicked me out again. <laughs> but fortunately, I'm back in. All right. Um, thanks for your contribution. I mean, I really love that. And I'd like to go to Ebi now, you know, still on that point that you, I mean, you just talked about. Ebi, can you hear me? Ebi, are you still with us? Uh, I'm not sure. It looks like we lost Ebi. All right, um, Charles, can you? Are you with us? Oh, okay. Ebi says she's here. Okay, but uh, for some reason I can't see you. Okay, so Ebi, um. You know, let's pick it back on what um, Chief Osasi just shared with us, you know, as regards um, the way government policies are created and all of that. What are your thoughts on, um, you know, talking about maybe things like the political culture, you know, because I do know that, I mean, I know for a fact that things like the political culture actually tend to impact the way uh, government policies are created. Uh, would you like to share your thoughts regards that area? It's it's very interesting that you said that. Um, can you hear me? Because I, I was just okay. It's very interesting that you said that because I was just having a discussion with somebody and I and I started talking about witch hunting of of people based on whoever is in power. And and it's very funny because then it makes you even more scared. I am one of the advocates that Nigeria has to. We Nigerians have to remain in this country to build this country because nobody else is going to build this nation for us. And in as much as we get upset with people who take their monies and finances outside of the nation to go build up better structures, maybe in Kenya, maybe in South Africa, maybe even just next by Ghana, in as much as we get upset at them, we must also understand that a lot of the political um, um, decisions and policies um, based on the new people that are coming in, affects certain business owners. It is not a problem if I if I run a business and I said I want I want to support this particular political party. But then if the political party goes out of power, it affects me inversely because next the next set of people coming in will say, oh, you supported this person. I mean, this is why. Um, and I like I like what Charles Tudor was talking about when he says that a lot of the things that we have in place are not really. 
they're, they're not really things that we can run by. It's like the structures are there. It's like, sorry, it's like the policies are there, but there's no form of accountability. There's no form of checkmating of the powers that, that are in place. So even when you think that you can have a business here, and as you keep talking about politics, I'm a politics student, so I, I keep asking myself, why is it different outside and why is it different here? The government is, is for me, I say this all the time, the government is supposed to go out of the way, get out of the way for the entrepreneurs to build this nation. Because all those things that we're doing, when, when somebody doesn't build, would rather build a hotel, a, a five-star hotel in South Africa and not build it here, it is because they think that after they build it and they somebody else has left power that the next government will chase them and it's not it's not unfounded because we're seeing it happen every single day and i know this is a very sensitive issue and a very sensitive time for us because in as much as we've all look we look as if we've moved on and charles said about how resilient nigerians are and that is true but it still burns and hurts in our hearts that a simple protest which was meant to change government or direct government in a in a in a very um uh, well what would i call it now in a very non-violent way has been taken out of context and now there's almost like a witch hunting i even just saw a a, a docu a sorry a a twitter where somebody was saying that um the csc had shut down an account of somebody just because they participated in protests but if you were if you were born outside in more developed nations they would tell you you don't stand for this then you stand for nothing because there are times when in all honesty our government doesn't know it all the policies don't have it all even the 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 the, the economic policies all the policies they're not in 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 themselves sustainable sorry not not in themselves um what, what's the word i'm looking for not in themselves able to capture everything in the, in the nation i think i'm going to get a better word a better word for it so this policies this change in government does affect everybody even as an individual even though i have no political um affiliations or anything as a normal nigerian person you just have that consistent fear that this thing is going to affect you just because you're supporting this person over this person so yes you are right that these 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 are issues that we need to we need to look at i don't know if i'm able if, if i was able to answer the question very well for you is that okay mr orok uh if ty was still with us you know since Merflin is here it'd be a good time to introduce her all right okay is she yes Um, Taiwo, your, your mic is muted. Great, great, great. Awesome. Right. So, so, yes, the team, they're setting it up and we... Um, Mr. Ora, can you move your... ...the special assistance to the governor of Akwaibom State on Entrepreneurial Development, Directorate of Marketing and Brand Management, a corporate communication expert, digital marketer and strategist, documentary filmmaker, TV presenter, artist, content curator, coach stroke advisor, and food engineer. She has trained a global network of intelligent professionals who identify communication needs and assist in developing concepts that are measurable to complement strategic entrepreneurial goals as Gill Multimedia CEO and founder of Gill Pay and Gallivin. As the special assistant to the governor, Udom Emmanuel, on entrepreneurship development, she is involved with training, coaching, business development, and community engagement, as well as building innovation clusters and accelerator models. She is also currently involved with an entrepreneurial development initiative, MEGP, My Entrepreneurship Goals Program, that focuses on providing continuous and sustainable engagement to a large segment of entrepreneurs and youth in the southern region of Nigeria. Thank you very much um, for this opportunity to talk. Um, go ahead. Yeah. Hi, Mifflin. How are you doing? Thank you. I'm fine. We're doing great. It's a wonderful day. So thank you very much for the opportunity to be a part of this session. 
man, great stuff we have here, tackling constraints, yeah. things started. Yeah. yeah. And today we're talking government policies. So, I mean, it's, it's really very um, uh, important at this point in time, uh, but I, I must really commend African entrepreneurs and Nigerian entrepreneurs who have been pretty much resilient uh, throughout this period. And we're looking forward to what happens after the protests and after uh, uh, you know the COVID. I mean, post COVID. So, if you want me to go ahead, I can. Or do I go ahead? Okay. Can we? Can you hear me? Yes. Go okay, ahead. Me? Okay. Should go ahead. Yes. Great. So, I listened clearly to Charles, Abby, uh, Chief, and. Um, they're saying something great and wonderful, but we just need to get back to the foundation and what is really wrong. Uh, entrepreneurship and small business development um, are the hearts of many countries, economy, and clearly countries uh, or states that give focus, you know, being the focus uh, on entrepreneurship development as it were, uh, relatively giving special attention to so this stands, uh, you know, better stand better chances of improved economy and industrialization. So we have a real issue here, even at the startup level. Okay, so we have real issues around the fact that uh, most startups don't actually come into the space, the entrepreneurship ecosystem, or the entrepreneurial space, well equipped, well focused, and well defined. They don't even know exactly what they're trying to do. Uh, people have different. Um, reasons to get into business. So it becomes a problem because government also wants to be able to have a relationship with you as a startup. They want to be able to know if you're sure of what you're doing. You're not just waking up to mix cereal, but you have to register your company. You've got to be able to have a relationship with you. Uh, you have to have the, your licensing done because that is an economic variable that will add to the indices we're looking at, the projections of gross domestic product index and relatively uh, the rest of the indus industries across the board when it comes to economic development. So it's a real big deal there because we have a, a foundational issue where you have the average startup think that financing is a problem. Meanwhile, that is not the problem. The problem is that you don't even have the knowledge, you know, you know, the basic knowledge to be able to go about what you want to do. So you don't know anything about registration and licensing, marketing and brand management. You don't know anything about um, uh, corporate financial accounting. You don't know anything about taxation and entrepreneurship. Uh, so this is a real big issue. At, and we're seeing some states across the Federation, just about four or five, uh, try, uh, beaming a focus on entrepreneurship development, which is giving rel a relative um, degree to this raise we're talking about, but you, you have yes. the rest of the numbers not doing that, and so it becomes an issue, uh, you know, as it were, because you see, information is key. Knowledge is key also, and whether people don't even know how to go about what they're doing, it becomes an issue. So while you're talking government, government has a problem with this thing, because government's focus is about creating the enabling environment for this to happen. I clearly uh, love what she said about border issues. Clearly, it's not even getting anywhere near. But like I said, I want to focus on the foundation, which is the basic start of that person beginning a new business. You understand? Okay. So you see that there's a real big issue because we're not getting it right from the beginning. And so the government also has this backlash because you're trying to say, I'm not doing anything more than uh, creating an enabling environment for you. Well, you've got to be able to do it right. You understand, and doing it right, you will need to get back to your normal registration and licensing. We really have a problem, really. I mean, government has an issue. So I tell most young startups, I, I tell them, uh, you are the industry. You are the industry. The government only builds factories. An entrepreneur defined, or an entre entrepreneurship ecosystem pretty much defines uh, you know, that particular society. You know, it's about these right. young people, it's 10 blocks, of young people, I mean, great numbers of young people doing what they're doing, but if they're doing it right, it also it also will create that positive impact on that economic variable that will make for the development of the society. So it's a two-way thing. 
much most of the time people always want to look at governments but also governments also wants to look at the fact that we're not getting it right from the beginning yeah we have right. agencies so doing what they're doing but we're not uh, getting it right and i'm sure that as we begin to be a focus on entrepreneurship development we will get it right in the course of our journey i believe nigeria is getting there pardon me i've got to come in here all right, thank you very much. You know, I was almost tempted to say, Honorable Minister, off your mic. No, no. <laughs> thank you. All right. Um, yes. Okay, fine. A lot of the things you've said are actually true, even though, um, you know, uh, for this summit, we want, to, we want to keep the focus on government policy, you know, for obvious reasons. There are going to be subsequent additions where we're going to look into other areas, other challenges. So this is just one of the challenges. I agree with you, many of the things, I mean, when it comes to SME development, if you talk about, um, most SMEs say they, they need finance and access to finance is one of their major issue, right? I agree with you that that is not always the issue. And sometimes it's not even just access to finance, it's finance for growth, access to markets and stuff like that. But for the purpose of this summit, you know, we may want to stay in the area of um, government policy, okay? and. Um, are you still with me? All right, so I'm gonna come right back to you. I wanna to go to Charles right now. You know, I'm gonna come right back to you. Give, given that you are a government player, I do have some interesting questions for you. All right. Hey, Charles, good to see you again. I'm here. <laughs> All right. Okay, so Charles, um, I'm sure you are, you know, because I, I can see that you are, besides being a brand management expert, you know, you do it on consultation basis, you know, consultancy yeah. basis, pardon me, you know, so, it, it, it goes without saying you you've dealt with quite a number of businesses you know mm -hmm. you get to see their challenges firsthand and stuff yeah, like that yeah. you know so um i'd like you to share with us these real life challenges now not just with regards to your own business but mm -hmm. with regards to your clients the challenges yeah. with regards to government policy yeah yes i think that the most um um the most obvious um challenge most um, even the the stable as uh, the stable businesses have is um, inconsistency in government policies and and then duplication of taxes inconsistency in government policies um, you have the federal issue have the issues of federal you have the issue with the states and then du duplication of taxes um, I watched something today about a, a lady complaining in a video. Um, she has two, two restaurants in Abuja, and then you have to go through two certain processes. You verify the health conditions of, of, her, of her staff, and then you pay to, for the main branch, and then they shut down her, her second branch in Abuja with customers inside it. And they, got, they said they got a, a court ruling. I mean, so there's inconsistency in policies from PHCN um, to the tax regulate tax people. So most of the clients I work with, even this, not just the, ups, the startups, stable brands, you, you, the frustrations are so obvious. Um, you have a client that you have much, that, that is, has filed a tax already and you have FIRS, you have ARRS after them, and then without any due recourse to receive they clamp down, especially when it's time and they're giving their, their, their targets. Now, the challenge I see is very obvious. We do not have a database and a structure that manages all this information as a globe, from the global point of view. So we have the state functioning and we have the, the federal functioning at the same time. Um, in some states, you have um, agencies just you for TV licenses. Uh, I've set up, um, I was part of those that set up a, um, an agency that regulates outdoor advertising in cross River state. I set it up. The processes we went through to set up that agency, even after we had won the bid, paid the bid price, and even got the House of Assembly to, have, to confirm it for four and a half years, just due processes. From this agency to this regulatory agency, the processes are too tedious. So you invest about 10, 15, 25 million in a bid, and it takes you seven and a half years to even take off. The state loses, the investor loses, the spirit dies. Who loses at the end? It's a system because at the end of the day, mediocres will take over. So the challenge I see from the global point of view is 
One, we have too many, dupl there's, dupl there's duplication of functions between the federal and the state agencies, both for CAC, the regulatory authorities, all they're duplicated. Then there is no consistency in terms of the, the content. One, you must have a database. You must have a process. So even if I register in local government or in state government and have my receipt, I should be able to seamlessly go online, upload it, and I'm, I'm free. You, so there's a, there's a big gap between the policies, the targets, and the result, the expected results. So we need to bridge, there's a, that gap has to be bridged. Then finally, I would say this, and that challenge I see, yes, I, I listened to um, Ms. Mefflin speak. That's another challenge. 99% of startups and entrepreneurs of recent, the past three, four, five years, do not understand what it is to be an entrepreneur. They don't have the rudiments, they don't have the content. So most of them just go in because they have a, pas a passion. Or they saw somebody else did it, tried to do it, and it, it succeeded a bit. So, I will leave my paid employment. Or you went for one of those seminars where motivational speaker will tell you, you can do it. Fly, fly, fly. What they don't tell you is when you fly, how do you land? How do you land when you fly? They don't give you the tools to, they just motivate you to fly, 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 fly. You want to my second, which is Konjo in her office. I told her, fly, fly. Okay. Now we fly to this window now. Where we fly? How do we <laughs> land? So, 98% of these fresh entrepreneurs are entrepreneurs by enthusiasm. So, on the journey they want to learn, it doesn't work. Government will not wait for you to grow up intellectually. You must go through the process. So, it's a gap between processes, knowledge, expectations. Synergy. So I like that. I'll rewind again. Government must put in place policies that ensures that from the national, federal, and the state, there must be synergistic approach to everything. To duplication of responsibilities, duplication of um, taxes, radio mm -hmm. here. You want for you to go from one state to the next state, you are going to pay the same tax across Nigeria. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. Yes. And okay. trust me, it's it's frustrating. Yes, I agree. I agree. All right, Charles, thank you very much. You know, I totally, totally agree with what you have said. Um, you know, uh, these, are, these are some realities. Um, it's a good thing you also agreed with um, uh, the, uh, the lady that just spoke now, you know, because um, she's also right. I agree with you when it comes to things like entrepreneurial thinking, which is the foundation that tends to be a gap, you know, so people just, uh, in fact, we're pretty much used to copy and paste type businesses, you know, we don't even necessarily set up these businesses to solve problems. But I want to go right to AB now, you know, so if you can pull AB up, I'll be very happy. AB, I do have a question for you. Yes, sir. AB, my, my, my question comes because, um, I mean, this question is because from your profile, I see you've, you've, you've played in the banking sector a little bit. So yeah. that's, I mean, definitely you've played in the finance sector. Do you get, Ebi, do you get the impression that, uh, you know, despite the rhetoric, you know, that has been, that's been sold to us, do you get the impression that sometimes the government is focusing too much on mopping up cash with these excessive um, regulations and taxations? You know, because Charles just talked about, what he talked about in summary is regulations. And, you know, if, I, 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 Charles, I'm still going to come back to you, yeah. honestly, because it's very, very important we talk about these excessive regulations, all right? Because government sets up policies, and I do know for a fact that there is a, there is a gap between the implementation of the policies and how brilliant the policies sound themselves. But for you, Ebi, do you get that feeling from someone who's from a finance background that the government is focusing too much on mopping up cash, mopping up money from the economy? You, you, you know what I mean, you know, and uh, putting pressure. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, from the little, from the little that I know, and we were just discussing it as well with the T bills and all those things. When they're trying to um, mop up cash and and um, and all the things that government does to reduce the amount of money in 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 circulation, I, I actually agree with the statements you just made. That we feel, I feel, um, 
And when I came into the banking sector, I didn't just come in um, knowing anything, which is some of the things that we have. So we, we come into structures, our businesses, and we don't understand what it's about. We just we were just dumped in the banking sector right after NYSC, and that's where we were thrown to serve. And after we served well, we were just asked to continue. In as much as you had trainings and, and all those things, it wasn't quite um, elaborate enough to tell you about the financial systems of the nation that you were, uh, of, the, of the country that you were working in. So even when you go for NPRs and you're hearing about um, the NPR rates and all those things, you can't really quite understand it except you are now, except now that I'm outside of the bank, I am beginning to understand how these things affect the the day-to-day -day runnings of the nation. But I would tell you that when I was in the bank, I really didn't understand why this these rates and all these rates and all this other stuff were, were going on. Um, if 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 I want to be quite honest with you, I I would I would say I I'm not really very knowledgeable about this part of of the question that you're asking. But I would say that when you look at the policies that the government are, it's not. And I know if there's excess money in the economy, it would lead to inflation. But I think again. If we um, look at what government is doing, just in terms of appointment of people in power and all those things, it will also seem that sometimes they don't put the people who can make the right decisions in those in those offices. Um, let me not just mention anybody's name, but there are people who we know that are very competent that can handle um, uh, economies or um, financial institutions properly much more than some people who have been placed there. However, the government will choose to um, get somebody who I, I, we, we can clearly see that the policies do not or are not friendly with the day-to-day -day runnings of the, of the country. And even when you have other um, financial institutions constantly saying, um, reduce this, increase this, um, um, increase the dollar rates, I am particularly affected directly in my school business by the rates of the dollar. But you, you just get that government is not listening. That's what I get. I just get that they're not they're not listening, or like Osazu said, they're not um, taking into account you who's daily running the business. So I don't know if there's a financial person here who'd be able to answer clearly the the policies um, in the financial sector that would directly affect us. Because I can I can only talk about the ones that I know um, when it comes to yes. affecting my business. Yes. Yes. All right. Thank you very much. You know, Chief um, Osazu. Well, I, I'm coming to you right now. Osazu, can you can you hear me? All right, Chief Osazu. If you can hear me, I'll just I'll just shoot. Um, AB just took us back to an area that we touched earlier, which is an area of political culture. You know, because even when it comes to employ um appointment of people who are to handle certain mission critical areas that impact the ease of doing business uh it's a big deal uh, uh you are a business leader do you want to share some thoughts with regards to your experience uh, you know i mean what you the little you know as regards how this our political culture tends to affect uh sme growth Okay, it looks like I lost the uh, chief of Sasu again. Okay, so pending when chief comes in, yeah, uh, we'll just keep talking, right? Uh, uh, thank you very much, Abby, for your, your, your thoughts in that area. Um, yes. Uh, we, are, we, we can agree that maybe the political culture tends to be an issue. Another area that we probably want to look at is the area of political stability. But I would like to hear some of us talk about um, things like interest rates, you know, and monetary policy, basically how it affects uh, SMEs. Um, so, Chief, are you still with us? All right, can you pull up Mefflin for me? I, I hope I'm pronouncing that name right. Oh, okay, Mefflin. <laughs> Mefflin, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, is your mic mic muted? 
Okay, so check. I can hear you clearly. Oh, super, super. Now, this question is special for you, you know, because I mean, you're in government anyway. You're a special advisor to the state government of um, Aquaibon, right? On, on uh, yeah, SME development, if, um, entrepreneurship development, right? Entrepreneurship, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and there are a few things you said, and those things have sort of re echoed uh, across our various speakers. So I'm going to throw it right back at your table. How much engagement, how much, you know, SMB engagement is the government doing to be able to actually identify the needs of the SMEs? Now, let's establish that we understand that there are challenges even with regards how people come up with the business ideas and all of that, you know. But we also do know for a fact, or we can agree in principle here, that the government needs to engage a bit more, all right, to be able to, with regards the needs of this SME so that they can come up with SME friendly policies. So from your own perspective, I, I know you can speak for your own state government. So would you want to share with us how much engagement are you doing with the SMEs to identify the actual needs in view of policy improvement? Great, thank you very much. So um, uh, if I may be my focus on uh, what I said earlier is um, it's one big reason this office had to be created, entrepreneurship development, as it were, because I told you that entrepreneurship education is very key, uh, and it's a key economic variable to developing any society, the economy of any society, or, as it were, bringing about industrialization. So one of the things we've been able to do, we have over 10,000 active uh, you know, startups, uh, who are being exposed to uh, basic knowledge of, uh, you know, how, what what happens in the business world. Uh, you, you're talking lack of finances. Uh, you, yeah, if we go right back to government policies, this particular year in Aquaibom State, we're seeing um, a focus on entrepreneurship education and then the budgets uh, pretty much lauding and, you know, focusing on economic, it's pretty much focused on economic development and human capital development is the first thing in the budget of Aquaibon State between now and I mean between the fiscal year of you know this period and then 2021. 20, uh, and that's to show you how serious it is uh, for Aquaibon State government because we believe that for us to be able to achieve industrialization as it were, we will need to be able to get back to telling the startups this is how you're going to go about it. If you have stuff you want to do, you've got to register it, you've got to get it licensed, you've got to have the knowledge about how finances work, how money works, you know, how to work out your corporate financial you know, account statements, you're on, you have to understand cash flow, you have to understand certain things. And so, yes, there's a concern around when you're done with all of that knowledge, yes, you still need funding for certain things. Of course, the opportunities everywhere, nonprofits, profits, venture capitalists, Angel investment, wonderful, but also the government is also able to provide um, um, loan, free interest loans for entrepreneurs to be able to access within the same period, as, as I just said. So there's a concern here for you know lack of finances, and and really, if I want to also be my focus on what is happening with social impact programs in at the federal government level. Uh, we've seen uh, the office of the vice president um, reaching out to startups to be able to get the registration done. Uh, we, we had a clear issue during the issue of survival funds, you know, release. People couldn't even have something as simple as business name. Do you understand? No team, no business. How, how are you going to be able to access this fund? You know, and then when you go right down to the suburbs where you have the agri, you know, agri, you know entrepreneurs who are doing their own thing, the women, the, the, the young people who are engaging in agri business across the, the, the local the suburbs, you know, you would, you, would, you would be so shocked that they have real issues in financial inclusion. They don't even have an, um, an account number. So the, the, there, are, there are issues that are there, but we're also trying to see how to make for financial inclusion, how to make for entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship education, how to make for uh, funding, uh, available funding for startups business supports. And right here at the Directorate of Mar Marketing and Brand Management, we, we run an EDP, an EDP is an entrepreneurship development program. So young people who want to do business, they come in and they get uh, trained. The government pays for all of that and, you know, and then helps them to have um, business support 
available, uh, available business support or opportunities available in the financial space for them to be able to get whatever they're getting. So there's a real, like okay, I said okay. from the beginning, there's a okay, real me, focus can I, can here in our five home states on entrepreneurship for education and for, yeah, go ahead. Please. Yeah, can I, can I just hold you for a moment there? You know, yes, I hear about these beautiful things you're doing, you know, and so we're going to move on to the others, the other speakers soon. All right. Yeah. But, you know, with regards policy, you know, Uh, I can hear you anymore. Like taxation, you know, areas like taxation, um, even your labor laws, market regulations, monetary policy, basically all of this affect the SMEs. Now, uh, at um, well, central governments basically always say a thing or two that, okay, like you mentioned the, federal, the um, vice president's office. Yeah. And when you go there, you're talking about the ease of doing business, okay? I did have, I did come within close proximity of that, you know, I wouldn't mention the program anyway. Now, uh, the government says they want to achieve ease of doing business, you know, but in terms of implementing at the MDA level, there seem to be huge gaps, huge, huge gaps. I can call those gaps monstrosities, if you like, you know, so, um, you know, so while you say on one hand, you want to make sure that it's easy for people to set up businesses and you want to provide the public enlightenment programs so that they know they have to register and they need to meet some basic criteria at the MDA level, how much is being done to ensure that the policy implementation makes sense? You know, because I, I did say earlier, there is a huge gap between policy development and implementation, the implementation plan. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. So, so clearly, like you said, uh, just before I came on board uh, this conversation, you said, let the right people be appointed into the right offices. If you do not have, you know, the, the framework and the background to be able to handle certain things, you can't go in there. You know, yeah. I just told you about having to, you know, get some women at the suburbs. That means I had to use my two legs to those places you know, to actually know you're into oil, oil, uh, you know, oil for an oil processing, for an example, and you don't even have a model that works for you business wise. But I'm going to just try to help you and get this thing done. So that kind of thing comes through and you're able to put them through that journey. It's, it's really key that we appoint the, the right people, uh, you know, to handle the right um, engagement, right. because, of course, uh, government, I would say clearly uh, involves advocacy. So where you do not have advocacy, it becomes an issue. Uh, so that is also what we're seeing as a problem uh, where you don't, I mean, I mean, I'll say it without, this is, I know we are global, but you know, but I'll say people have been a bit about, I don't want to lose my office. No, you don't need to do that. If you have a responsibility, then you have to drive that focus. If you see that, that a social impact program is not running well, you have to tell the leadership that is not how to go. And that's why you're seeing that this focus has not just taken a turn in public enlightenment in Akwaibom State, but it has gone to the point where the government of Akwaibom had to put it as the first focal, uh, you know, driver of his second, uh, uh, you know, 2021, 2019, uh, 20 fiscal year. That's to show you how serious the drive is. All right. So I think that all the all most all important right. part right. is Mif for people right. to Mifflin, be We're going to have to keep yeah. an eye on you and Akwaibom and what you guys are doing there. All right, so I'd like to speak with Chief now. Take note, but, but let me, an eye, and we'll come back to you later to see how you guys are doing. Hey, Chief. Chief Osasu, are you with us? Can we, uh, can you pull up Chief, please? Oh, Chief is not here, oh, really? All right. So Charles, Charles, are you still with me? Can, can you pull up Charles for me, please? Is Charles still with me? Ah. Okay, Taiwo. Taiwo, I can't hear you. I love Taiwo, you. your mic is muted. Okay. I love the discussions that have been going on. 
I love the discussions that have been going on as to uh, some of the challenges faced. But you know, the kind of uh, feedback I'm getting is that the issues around the challenges entrepreneurs face, uh, particularly startups, with regards to their policies, those policies as how they become detrimental is of utmost importance. All right. So um, one of the things that we sought to do was in the assemblage of, of, of this team, of this panel, we, we, we looked and said, look, can we have them dimension uh, based on what they are currently experiencing or yes. what they experience in, in terms of the challenges they face yes. with regards to their particular industry? Um, so uh, at some point, you know, I, I know uh, Mr. Charles we have talked around uh, the multiple taxation, yeah, and then I also wanted to say, okay, what are the required intervention or suggestion, mm. suggestions on the part of government to take it further? Oh, um, yes, so we're we, definitely we, going to come we, to that. We, we, we know around issues concerning the schools, all right? Schools are inundated with, uh, you know, various um, regulators thronging in and out. So, the, the, you know, it would be nice to also get this going because the audience are, you know, are restless as to say, what then can we do differently? How can we get people together? We are in pain. You know, almost sounding like mm, that, that man. I'm in pain. All right. Uh, and then I, I listened to something you said there about, um, about the growth and development uh, uh, recently by uh, um, Peter Side, uh, uh, Tedo Peter Side. And uh, the, the richest man in uh, Africa, Dagote, said something. He said, when, if, um, if you get to heaven uh, and uh, when on Judgment Day, if you're a Nigerian <laughs> entrepreneur, that they would ask you to say, you know what, you can't go to hell twice. You know. So that, those are real things. So, so please, uh, it would be nice to, and then, you know. Yes. All right. So, um, okay. Since I couldn't get Charles, can I have AB again? Can we have AB up again? Mr. Charles is here now, so you could. Hello. Oh, Taiwo, that's you. <laughs> Hello. Hello. I can. I can. Yeah, I'm. I'm here. I can hear you. I had yes, a glitch. Yes. yes. I had a little glitch here. Go ahead. Okay, you had a little. Okay. Okay. Well, welcome back. Welcome back. Yeah. Welcome back. Basically. All right. So now let's even zone in. A, zone in a bit on what we do. You know, like your business, mm -hmm. just like uh, what Taiwo was saying. You know. Um, mm -hmm. You talked very, very passionately about the issue of um, government regulations, okay? Yeah. How this duplicated, how they tend to affect your cl your clients and all mm -hmm. of that. Now, um, one area we didn't cover, uh, even though I know you, 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 you did attempt to cover it a little bit, you know, but let's zone in on the specifics for the sake of yeah. our audience so that they can learn from you. Because I do know that as consultants, you have already thought about a few years that government needs to look into to improve how, I mean, this whole regulatory system, you know, the entire regulatory frameworks for, for various mm. sectors, basically. Mm. Or maybe you even want to focus on your own industry. That's fine. Mm. Okay. I, I've, okay, first of all, you can't put in place um, any regulation without engagement. So yes. as government, and this affects even the Nigerian brand, the attempts to brand Nigeria. For me, that's my, my global focus. How do we want to even position this country as a brand. So let's yeah. take it from the frame, from the global, the brand called Nigeria. So right. I ask the question, is Nigeria a brand or a product? The question I keep on asking, is Nigeria a brand or a product? So today I keep saying this, Nigeria is still a product because we don't have in place an infrastructure or a structure that articulates who we are. Now, we, if we're made up of nation states, there must be what I call the social contract. And that social contract cannot be put together by engagement. You have to ask us what we think about who we are, and then what are we expecting from government so that we can also know what we are giving back to government. So if you are regulating in any sector, for instance, let's leave even the branding advertising sector. If you are regulating, it's not about having a town hall meeting or sitting with different people, but it's about putting in place, first of all, 
One, who are we talking with? Why are we talking with them? And what do we expect? So that puts in place a framework. So the framework, and then what's the expected end? Based on that, you have a process that activates or initiates the engagement. Okay, we want to talk to A, B, C, D, E, um, people in social, A, B, C, D, social economic strata. So based on that, we put in place processes. So you engage the people. So now you want to talk to an entrepreneur that's an upstart or you don't want to talk to an entrepreneur that's evolved before, beyond being an entrepreneur. Now he's now a stable entrepreneur and he's running an SME and then a successful now goes a PLC. Those are different engagements, but you cannot put in place policies from Abuja Central that affects all of the country and expect us at, you expect comp compliance who client and sinker. So there must be engagement. So put in place an, a structure that ensures that you can get inputs. One, what is the, put in place a survey, what is affecting us right now? COVID-19 has demystified every business model we thought we had known. Even if you had gone to Harvard, look, the whole world is in chaos. Now, even before COVID-19, we had these deficits. Why don't we put in place infrastructure to ensure that we get the inputs from everybody? Government on your side, yes. Regulatory authorities, yes. But why don't you have a process that captures the feel and the experiences of everybody, put into a pool, and then we can now revisit all those policies that are in place so that we can bridge the gap between the policy, reality, and expectations. Or else, we will still remain where we are with government staying up there, those working for government, acting as if they are not part of us as entrepreneurs and normal Nigerians, but because they have a badge and ID card, implementing policies that do not really, really add value to the system. So then if you want to spe be specific now with advertising and branding, we have too many outdated, outdated, outdated policies that are totally irrelevant to this scheme of things. Many years ago, it was about advertising itself as a core. I started with advertising, but I moved away into brand management. That is a specialist area. It's not about advertising. Till date, government does not even understand that if you're going to set up AppCon and the board of directors or whatever, you need to recognize that advertising has gone beyond having one person with a briefcase just marketing. Marketing has gone beyond that. PR has moved beyond that also. Totally outdated laws. We have branding as a major sector that generates income beyond 20. <laughs> it's amazing globally. In developed economies, we have databases. In this country, we don't even know how many people are even practicing. And then we do have a structure that recognizes the impact of advertising in terms of creating brand identity, sustaining it, and then from but beyond the corporate, there's a personal brand. So a governor is moving around, or a senator is moving around, or a CEO is moving around without a personal brand structure, internal. And then becomes a governor. So he comes into that office with all the deficiencies from his past, and he has the pen, the green pen that can give him powers to do and undo. So what, does, what happens? He represents his village, not the state in his thinking. So we need to move away from the old and the pecuniary to a point where, for instance now, by January 20th, Trump will be removed from the, the White House. Whether he likes it or not, once it's confirmed, he does have to accept the accede. Once the voting, the, the electoral college acknowledges it, he's out. That's where we need to get to where our infrastructure, the policies are automatic and they are not, they're independent of the individual. So from policy to implementation, bridge the gap so that the institutions function independently of whoever is the DG or the head or the governor so that yes. it's sustainable long-term. Yes. That's yes. the gap I see. Sustainability All right. All based right. on empirical facts and long-term. All right, Charles. I, I'm told that you 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 might have to run soon, all right? So that means that you you, you have to share the, and you can't just run away without sharing some, some, some words with the audience. You can, you can't do that to us, okay? So um, 
I don't know. Maybe you want to give us some advice, you know, give your the listeners, I mean, our audience, a bit of advice. You know, sometimes they say that if the mountain won't go to Mohammed, Mohammed has to go to the mountain. You know what I mean? So you probably have some advice for them with regards to what role they can play in ensuring that government policy can improve. So uh, I'll still let you have the floor. Okay, first of all, I want to say th thank you to the organizers of this of the Startup Summit. I want to thank you. I appreciate it. Um, this is just beginning. This is a platform that, that I can I see will add value. I want to say thank you to all the other panelists, um, AV, Mefflin, um, I can't. Okay, just thank you to all of you for contributing healthy. Your content um, were, were very healthy and they, they, they were in-depth. Now, going to the uh, advice, um, I would say for all of you that are part of this, just consistently add value beyond the value you see. Be the change that you seek, because whatever I will complain about, if you look, if you point this finger at government or point this finger at regulatory authorities, it will still point back at you. If I point like this now, look at my, my finger is like this way, but the remaining three are pointing back. So government will not be that you, you want if you do not put your house in place. Acquire the requisite knowledge. If you don't have it, go ask for help. Get superior knowledge. Do not be um, um, mediocre. Don't stay in your sport. Be hungry for more knowledge. No knowledge is lost. At the risk of being ridiculed, still ask for help. And if you cannot afford the help, just beg and say you need help. And rather, instead of staying in your mediocrity, seek superior knowledge. But first of all, put your structure and your house in, in, in order before you start criticizing government policies. Government is government. You are you. The future of Africa and the world remains and resides in entrepreneurships. The more entrepreneurs we have out there doing great things, the less unemployment, the less crime we're gonna have, and this country, Africa and the world will be the better place. So once again, okay. I wanna say thank you thank for the you. opportunity and I look forward to adding value beyond today and let's share more insights. God bless thank you. you. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charles. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it, it, it'd be nice to speak with Abby now. Can, can you bring Abby in, please? I'm right here. Hi, Abby. Hi. So I can just listen to Mr. Mr. Charles. No, it's all right. all right. I could just Thank listen to Mr. Charles all day. Like, Yes. Amazing, yes. amazing. He's, he's amazing. But well, you're amazing too, you should know that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Ebi. Um, you know, since time is far spent, you know, um, there are two things I'd like you to do. Um, you know, we haven't really focused on your business, you know, sure. right now, you know, you're sure. in the educational sector, which has taken a, I mean, it took a huge hit in terms of um, disruption, you know, it was right. heavily disrupted by the um, COVID-19 and the lockdowns that followed the, the uh, the the virus come I mean coming upon the world and all that you know so I'd like you to share with us you know um, how government's policies or lack of have affected you because I do know it's very interesting you right. know you guys have had right. to innovate and like computer says you innovate or you die yeah all right yeah. yes so if you're still in business I'm sure you had to innovate so share yeah. with us and then we would also use that you know, to move into some of your final um, remarks. Great. Yeah. I, I, I said yesterday that anybody in business right now should actually be applauded because this is the most difficult time. And because we don't have a lot of time, I want to start with the internal problems within the education sector and why the external problems, which is the government policies, have actually affected us. One of the major constraints in the education sector is the administration, administrative issues. We have issues like accounting, we have issues like finances, we have personnel, we have management issues. The major one is the personnel because the turnover of teachers moving from one school to, to the other. I, I used to ask questions like, why, why is it that the teachers of old were more 
um, they had more state power than the teachers of nowadays. It's, a, it's almost as though the education sector was seen as a dumping ground, but people are now beginning to realize, and that's what the COVID taught us, that the education is the backbone of anything that we want to do in this economy. Even the economist, it was an educator that taught them. And now you can see the great deficits even from just merely making the, the budget of the year, look at how low the education sector budget is. So when the COVID hit, it affected a lot of things. Operating problems was the major one. All the marketing, the inventory, the production, the operations, everything that happened within the school came to a halt. I said yesterday, um, and I was talking to Tyra, I said, I started this term with a zero balance. This is because even those who have outstanding tuition fees to pay were much more affected by the COVID because in their offices they probably took a pay cut just so that they stay in business however for example the first the one that was that was very um very open for all of us to see is that government said workers people who were in the civil services should go back to work but then the schools had not resumed and then you can uh, you can just look at this literally that their parents who don't have any support system at home and you have asked them both father and mother to go back to work to leave their children with who we had that issue for almost a month plus you also have the issue of technology because a lot of us and and i would say this here and i hope this gets into the the, the people People who make the policies we need to be able to begin in our educational sector to teach entrepreneurial skills because this is the skills that would allow all of us to thrive much more than any government policies because if we can manage the little little things that we have around us we would be able to try strategic problems where where one because nobody had the plan nobody foresaw the future nobody understood how the COVID was going to affect us so the technological problems that 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 caused the, the, I mean, the technological issues already in the government that was not upgrading their systems in terms of technology in schools. I mean, some schools have it good, but it's it's not a level playing ground because you tell me as a private school owner, as, as a private school owner, that my children should know computer and all those things. But then in the public schools, you have you don't have this in place. Then when we're about to resume, which is now coming to the external factors, you gave us 107 pages to resume as public schools private schools. I wonder if the public schools had this. We were told we needed to put X, Y, and Z hand washes outside to accommodate the students. We were told we needed to put an isolation center apart from the sick bay in the schools. And look at some schools. They don't even have the space to carry on what it is that they were supposed to do in the first place. So you have regulators coming into the school to, to give you the approval for you to begin the session after the COVID. And they're asking you for an isolation center. Excuse you, Isolation center, are we now going to be keeping, keeping COVID patients in the center? If you tell me I should check for temperature, and if the temperature is beyond 36.7 or 36.9, I should send the child home. Why then do I need an isolation center when I have a sick bay? It was all these things that just made the sector just seem like it was overbearing. A lot of school yes. owners who just went into the education sector could not yes. thrive. So, um, infrastructure was a problem, technology was a problem, corruption is another problem because even yeah. as Charles has said, continuity in the policies was not there. You have all yeah. sorts of people coming to you to say, I want this money for this tax, yeah. you have this one for this yeah. tax, and there is no record. Just a simple one, Oroch, a very simple one, water bill. Somebody came to school and consistently was saying he was from water board. And if we don't pay him this bill, he was going to cut off the water. After paying like three or four times, another group of people came again and said, um, you have not paid water board bill. Backdating the fees back to January, this is what you're owing. And I said, yeah. come on, what is going on? Thank God we had the number of the other guy who had come and we called two of them together. And then both of yes. them explained to us that their system had a backlog of updates oh. that they had not done. Oh. So even when you are paid 50%, you still did not have it. Accountability and communication. These are some of the external factors. What I actually want to say is that for government, in conclusion, for government to actually be able to apply what it is, the policies that they are going to do right to us, they have to yeah. be able to 
um, um, affects the following indices, and they include technology, they include people, they include okay. land, and they include funds. You cannot tell me that minimum wage is 18,000, and you as a government of a state, you cannot pay 18,000, and you want me as an individual to pay 18,000. You cannot also tell me that, I mean, my, I'm in Abuja, for example, my school is not in one of the high places like um, um, Wuse or Maitama. My school yes. is, is in the outskirts of, of, of this, of this um, places, but land is actually an issue and if you don't have the right amount of money you cannot buy this places. so there's just a lot that we have to deal with and, I, and oh. i'm really excited about this conference because for somebody who is about to go into the education sector they need to think harder than just thinking that is a competition no there is a structural problem yeah. in education and we're not here for competition in the education sector we are here for collaboration so i don't see why an individual will go and open another sector of, of another school when you can actually collaborate with another person i'm so sorry but this is I, something that I is so that. So personal to me because I see it. If we're going to be training the 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 private school children in the best of schools, the best of technology, who is going to be focusing on the public school students? Because at the end of the day, we're all coming back to the same economy, and then you begin to see the same disparity in in private school children and public school children. If the government are going to make policies, make it a flat policy where all of us are affected by the same thing, the same thing for public schools, the same thing for private schools. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Pardon me, but I have to clap for you. I mean, oh. besides transferring your energy, you transferred a lot of knowledge. And I do hope a lot of people are learned, have learned from what you've said and are going to apply what you've said, even in different sectors. Because if I'm to sum up what you have said, business continuity is an issue. You know, that, that was the gap when COVID-19, the whole COVID-19 wahala started and we had to lock down. What businesses struggled with was business continuity, especially the educational sector. Now, yeah. even on the government end, they should be thinking about underwriting technology policies to ensure that there's business continuity. You understand? Yes. So this is really, really good. All right. I'm wondering, people, is Chief still with us? Is Chief still with us? All right, can, can I have Mefflin, please? Is Mefflin still with us so that we can wrap up? Absolutely. My recommendation. All right, okay. all right, Mefflin. Thank you. Right. So my recommendation. OK, we're about to wrap up now. So Absolutely. You know, can we hear your recommendations? OK. My, my with recommendation. Policy. Yeah, with regards to yeah, their policy, yeah. Okay. My recommendation right. would go straight up to five key things. Firstly, I would, I would recommend that um, the government, uh, you know, should be a focus on entrepreneurship education across the 36 states of the federation. We yeah. should also look out for um, database creation and documentation. Uh, let's say, for an example, when you talk about agri sector, it becomes an issue because um, in trying to uh, make policies for the agri sector, you need to know the numbers. And where you do not know the numbers, you can't even uh, begin to create, uh, you know, programs and profess solutions to these people because you haven't been able to um, quantify them to even be able to understand the people that need financial inclusion in the suburbs so it becomes an issue so uh, it also affects when you also have uh, agri programs that you're trying to reach out to people so at the end of the whole day it doesn't trickle down to the real people that need uh, that particular um, you know program um, basically we also have issues with power constraints if we can have um, uh, power constraints sorted at um, several levels, that's talking to the federal government at that point. We, it will help the technology incubators and, of course, uh, the digital economy to be able to engage. And, of course, manufacturing and production companies will be able to, uh, you know, uh, you know, produce and help in, in our, our gross domestic index raise. Also, we look at uh, we look at uh, taxation as a problem. Over taxation, double taxation. A policy of tax cuts and uh, low tax regimes, you know, can work out, uh, you know, certain things that we can um, look at in that particular uh, component. And then also internet penetration becomes an issue. Uh, like she said, there, it becomes an issue if um, you can't drive, work with the necessary stakeholders to drive policies that will help and make for um, decrease in cost of data and of course internet penetration so it's a big deal across board yes 
it's a big deal across board. I, I must tell you, um, it's the journey that we would have to uh, look forward to positively. Uh, we would really need to pray that the right leaders, the right people are driving the right policies, but we will need to be more focused on these areas. Like I said, documentation, data, it's a big deal because you can't, you can't, uh, you know, profess solutions where you don't have data. You don't have data, and so you can't get it right. And and following through um, in financial inclusion for uh, inclusion for people in the rural areas also becomes a problem. The use of technology becomes an issue. Power still becomes an issue. So there are real there are real issues. Give us, I mean, government here talking. Uh, give us the necessary infrastructure, and then the economic revolution will happen. And also on the side of the startups, get right there and get your education right. Understand what you're doing, why you're doing what you're doing. I mean, like she said, teachers are not being very, you know, driven. But I think the real problem is today, the people who wanted to do teaching, is that really what they wanted? Or the economy threw them into that whole framework of, you know, I just want to have a job, so I need to go oh. ahead. So it becomes an issue. So I celebrate the guys that are doing great things uh, in, in, in conclusion. I, I mean, I really, uh, working in the entrepreneurship ecosystem, I've met lots of vibrant young people who are doing great stuff, preferring local, national, and global solutions, even in data, as, as I earlier said. Uh, I really uh, want to encourage them to go ahead. And of course, our young people doing well in the fintech uh, sector. Uh, helping us disrupt the system, bringing through, uh, you know, the new revolutions we're seeing in Paystack and other ones who are doing great. I mean, you're doing amazing. And now we're seeing right. this work. So I know that if we can get these things right, uh, entrepreneurship education, agribusiness data documentation, and of course, financial inclusion, the use of technology, power, solution, subsidization, uh, you know, costs, and of course, uh, you know, internet penetration, we will do a lot more, a lot more in the, in the, in the next five years to 10 years. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Kathleen. Uh, I don't know why my, I don't know why my camera seems to have gone off. It says it's on right here. All right. Let me just check that for a moment. Okay, guys. Ty, was it better now? All right. So, folks, I thank you very much. You know, um, sorry, I don't know why my I've lost my video feed. You know, but we've all heard from these brilliant, 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 extremely brilliant panelists. You know, um, I hope we've all learned a thing or two. You know, because now we know that government policy always, I mean, sort of affects. Okay, uh, government policy affects everything. You know, that essentially affects the way businesses are able to run. The issues like uh, political stability, political culture, taxation, spending, interest rates, regulations and permits, as well as monetary policy. These are all the issues that affect um, SMEs. All right, so people, I thank you very much for your time. I do hope you have enjoyed being with us, and I hope you have learned a thing or two from us. Okay. Um, so, um, Taiwo, do you want to come in now? I think we should have some closing statements from Ebby. Yes, we should. Uh, you know, yeah. I'm so elated. Um, yeah. I'm so elated at the, the way the discussions have gone, um, notwithstanding some of the breaches I've experienced. It would be nice to have AB and Matthew, uh, give us their closing remarks. Yes, their closing okay, remarks. Yeah. Uh, so, Avi, you need to unmute. Certainly. Thank you yes. very much. I said I was, good, I was going to give it to the special advisor to have the closing remarks. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you so much, Avi. I, I love the passion you bring to the education sector. I mean, look at you there talking public and private sector. 
engagements. That was pretty uh, stellar. So I would say that, I mean, great job, startup specialist, Tayo, Mr. Tayo, you're doing a great job. Uh, I think it's, we need all of this engagement as we going forward. I mean, we're just hoping for the best. 2021 comes through as one fresh air that we, we've been looking forward to breathing <laughs> away from the post-COVID, uh, you know, post-protest, post-drama uh, in the White House. So we're just yeah. looking forward to several things that we'll be looking forward to. Uh, 2021. Mm. I believe that the, the rave and the revolution, I think a lot of this, all of these things have really uh, awakened our desire to uh, get back to the drawing board to getting things right. Even for the governors across the 36 states of the Federation, uh, they've actually, I mean, the government has seen a focus uh, that really needs to be uh, given attention to. So I'm sure that as we begin to, uh, you know, uh, add our quota to the development of our society, um, Every staying in Abuja, every other person in Lagos, another person for Takas, I'm sure we will all get to the Senate at the end of the whole day. We will become the, the new drivers of the economy, and that's what is important. Thank you very much. I like that. I like that. Thank you very much, my friend. People needed to hear those words. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right, Taiwo. Okay, good. Evie, can we hear some closing remarks from you? Oh, I, I, I totally agree with um, what Mrs. McLean has said. I am, we are certainly starting up something new. We are, everybody is reconsidering, like almost going back to the drawing board, and we're reconsidering and reconstructing all that is going to make for us to thrive in this economy. I can only say that the future is only brighter. I can only say we can only do better if we just keep at it. Um, consistency, they say, will breed um, much more results. So um, with um, opportunities like the Startup Summit and so many others and what the, the Special Advisor is doing and so many others and Mr. Charles Tudor and all of them um, doing what it is that they're doing to help the simple startups and the entrepreneurs all over, I, I'm certain that Nigeria would, I, I see Nigeria becoming a, a destination where people want to come to just to come and see how we thrive, not just beyond the COVID, because we did um, excel past many nations um, just with, with, um, about the COVID and how we're going to thrive much more in our economy. I, I see a brighter and a new Nigeria coming up. Thank you so much for this. And we look forward to the first and the second um, for the main summit. Awesome. Wow. This, you know, I'm so honored to have great minds, you know, on this platform, and I'm so excited that the first is 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 just sticking around. But we remember we have another event on the 26th, which is the final of the series in this iteration of the launches. Uh, and um, you know, I can be you can be rest assured that we're going to be having um, people come and tackle issues around finance and marketing. Um, so we have couple, you know. The guys that own uh, Maryland Mall, uh, we have uh, you know the lady that's in charge of the Afri or uh, and a whole lot of others. So I'm just saying, look, this something about government sometimes government can be boring, but you know there's a lot of interesting times ahead. And we're also gearing up for the main, 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 main event on the first and the second of December. So I'd like to say thank you so much for turning up for the Nigerian Startup Summit pre-launch. Uh, and whilst we gear up for the the uh, the main event on the first and the second, we also still have another pre-launch, and then we're also going to be having some fire, you know, fireside chats uh, on Instagram just to you know get the appetite of people going on. One of the things we also are doing uniquely is we have, we have three uh, sets of master classes: uh, one on branding, uh, which the the star of uh, of branding, uh, Charles Otudo, has volunteer to also unveil uh, you know intently the issues around branding so it's, uh, there's going to be a link for for you to sign up exclusively for that we're also going to be talking about the regulatory you know issues and you know with legal framework and you know setting out uh, mitigation all right mitigants to uh, you know to help quell any unlikely occurrence and then we're also going to be born in, uh, finance uh, at the beginning of this manifest in the one master class. So great, great times ahead. And we hope that this, like you said, 
set up you know the the trajectory uh, to further broaden and develop the the entrepreneurial ecosystem. And on this note, I hand over to Mr. Arok. I say thank you. I like to thank all that all those that have been part of the panel. Uh, this AB, I like to thank Ms. Mesley. All right. I like to thank Chief of Staff. I like. What, what have I met? Mr. Charles, yes, I like, like Mr. Charles. And then it is, uh, uh, everybody. Thank, thank you, Chief. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's been it's been great. And we look forward to okay. doing more so together. We're, we're done. Thank you. We made it. Yes, yes, All yes, right. yes. <laughs> All right, guys. Bye. Bye. Right. Yes. Thank you.